Hello friends, this is the AlphaList podcast. I am your host Toby. The goal of the AlphaList podcast is to empower CTOs with the info and insight they need to make the best decisions for their company. We do this by hosting top thought leaders and picking their brains for insights into technical leadership and tech trends. If you believe in the power of accumulated knowledge to accelerate growth, make sure to subscribe to this podcast. Plus, if you're an experienced CTO, you will love the discussion happening in our Slack space where over 600 CTOs are sharing insights or visit one of our events. Just go to alphalist.com to apply. Welcome to the Alphalist podcast. I am your host, Toby, and today I'm talking to Mr. No Code. Uh, I from now on call him like that. Um, it's Andy Wixler, the CTO and founder of Finn. Finn is a huge car lending company or car subscription company, I, th I think I, I should uh, rather correctly say. I think they raised over 100 million. They got like 1 billion, I think, in, in uh, venture debt and so on. So it's a huge thing. They are invested among their investors. There are, for example, the Zolando founders and a few very, very well-known VCs. And Andy, you're, you're using a lot of no-code. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, first of all, welcome. <laughs> yeah, first of all, Toby, thank you for the invitation. And uh, this why is definitely, I think we have now almost an hour to answer this question. Um, and thank you for Mr. No Code. Um, I like it. I like it, to be honest. And um, yeah, the why is actually really, really nice. Um, I, yeah, I mean, imagine you are, I mean, we founded the company in 2019, in October 2019. Uh, of course, we founded it earlier. We did the, all the use cases, all the math behind that. And then you're sitting there with seven people in a small room. And um, yeah, you have no engineers. You have a nice idea in mind. Yeah, car subscription for everyone. And um, it's a asset heavy business. You would like to run it asset light as an operations and yeah. And then you try to understand, okay, what are the options that I have there? And uh, with a, let's say engineering background, you know, there are a few things you have to avoid, especially in the early stages of a, of a company. And that's definitely engineering for the sake of engineering. That's something to avoid. And you realized, okay, there are a few things out there, some new, let's say hypes out there, no code, low code, hard code or pro code. And yeah, and then the whole thing start to start and kicks in. You built the first website um, on, let's call it, it's not a no code tool, it's a web flow. You, uh, you store your, let's say five different cars, five different models that we have, all Opel, no joke. <laughs> and you put them in a Google spreadsheet. Um, you connect Webflow with Google Spreadsheet. And then <laughs> um, the first, you know, three months was just me recruitment, seven, eight interviews a day, getting engineers on board. And uh, yeah, meanwhile, an intern building a website and connecting some spreadsheets together. And this is how you get into no code. I would like to say it's like a structured approach, but this is how we ended up. Okay, that's simple. Maybe before we, we dig deeper, um, a few more words about yourself and like how you got into nerdism and computing. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> how, how did you get there? Oh, so I started very, very early. Like my first, you know, code, um, I think I wrote it with Quick Basic back in the days. And um, in 1993, and, yeah, and then... You start to 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 code your first uh, own games, you know, and um, I I was a backend engineer for ages. Um, got some somehow into the whole security topic as well, and uh, yeah, and then I think I was a okayish and, and good backend engineer. Front end is is just a disaster, you know. <laughs> you should never uh, give me some front end code. And um, yeah, this is how I got into code. I was always curious. But um, 
there was a point in time in engineering in software engineering where I really realized the best engineer is the one that can solve a problem without writing a single line of code. And that was the guiding rule for me for decades now. Okay. Um, and, and where did you realize that? Like uh, that you <laughs> sh should not write too much code? I realized that when I wrote my third or fourth own framework. This was this good old days, you know, you start as a PHP developer, PHP 3, and then everyone is building his own framework. And same for me, you know, I am the greatest engineer on earth, no doubt about that, right? And then you implement your own framework, routers, controllers, MV, um, MVC, and then a week later, you just go through the code and like, why? <laughs> and then self-reflection i would call it okay um and uh, th then you 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 welcomed the no code world in a way um or realized like or like had this not really the strategy but it accidentally <laughs> happened that you wanted to connect uh the, your your webflow to to google spreadsheet and then i guess like the magic went on and uh, I don't know, you used maybe Airtable or something like that at a certain point because you thought, okay, yeah, a relation database is better than a spreadsheet or like, no, how, did no, that, no, no. how did that progress? <laughs> no, no, no. I think I, I spent like decades in coding, like really, really coding as a backend engineer, worked also some for two and a half years for IBM R&D, like really worked for, with some really, really smart people. And um, yeah, that was necessary just to realize how important coding is. On the other hand, and this no code, um, let's say universe opened up like three years ago, um, realized that in order, you know, to in increase the efficiency of your engineers, there's an, another guiding rule is, I call it, we buy commodities and we build assets. And, you know, for building assets, you need time. So how can we remove all these annoying requests from your engineering team? That was always the guiding question in my head. You know, you should ask myself, or I did it way too often, implementing a PDF library to export some invoices or some stupid internal tools, sorry for saying stupid, simple, Internet tools just to have a table view with some CRUD operations. It's always the same, just the domain change. Why remove all these annoying topics from the engineers so they can really focus on building assets? And that hurts and my, my heart is bleeding if I see this every time. And then you <laughs> think, okay, how can I get and uh, remove this annoying request from my engineering department? No code is one, uh, one, um, approach and low code is the second approach but this is low code is closer to the engineers as no code yeah. mm -hmm. um, and you you started then at Finn to rather use no code in the first place and then ended up with with low code or like could could you say that this is like a progression or yes so I think um, you can structure this into two pillars no code is for business for no, non-engineers and low code is for a tool or another, let's say, a small tool in the equipment set of an engineer to, for, for instance, for writing internal tools. It's amazing to start with internal tools. We, we are using e um, e retool, sorry, retool, uh, for uh, as a, our low code tool for all the internal tools. We can talk about that for sure. And no code for no code we use make or previously called Integromat for all the no-code activities. And really, this no-code activities, I think we are cutting edge there. So we are really, really, we are, there's automations for everything that you can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and and, <laughs> and um, uh, like in, into which bucket you would you put Airtable, like I, it's a tool I use regularly, so uh, that's why I'm asking. Um, and it's in a way has both sides, right? It has like some low code aspects and some no code aspects, and really has like a huge lock in. Uh, you discover after you put in your first, uh, I don't know, 20,000 uh, records. Um, 
Where where would you put it in? No code and definitely no code. So if if I has uh, if I have to answer this question, Airtable is a nice beast. Let's say it's a very nice beast because so the way how we ended up with Airtable was. You go, you know, the Google spreadsheet was not enough. You had this entity car, and then all of a sudden you have more entities. Deliveries, violation tickets, speed violation tickets, and then the whole entity model gets bigger. And we are, okay, how can we use the benefit of a spreadsheet in a, let's call it a, a bit more structured way. And then you're ending up with Airtable. You all the non-engineers, the love Airtable. You have an API for the engineers, so you have at least a structured uh, way to read this. Let's call it semi-structured data. And then you realize, okay, there are some pitfalls to Airtable. Five requests per base per second. Five requests, man. <laughs> My iPhone could generate more requests per second, right? Um, Limitations to um, to the base line items. I think it was back in days one hundred thousand. Now it's two hundred fifty thousand, and there are a lot of limitations to that. And I mean, you can do the math. There are some limitations to that. On the other hand, it's an excellent tool for, for instance, if you know this this base will not end up also not in the next ten years with more than fifty thousand um, line items. So this is our guiding rule. We have a simple rule. If you think in the ne next 10 years, we won't get more than 50,000 rows, then go for Airtable, for instance, to store some employee-related data. I mean, I don't think we will end up with more than 50,000 employees in the next 10 years. Really not? <laughs> uh, can I ask for more, for more equity? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. So is your strategy to, to use those tools company-wide or like you automate a lot of your work, I, I assume then, or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we use Airtable company-wide, yes. There's, I would say, no limitation to that, except our core business. So our core business, and this is what we do right now, we It's a real migration project. We migrate all the core business entities and domain into Postgres to a, let's go, the pro, pro database with pro code with, um, exposing APIs. Everything is serverless. That's, and the rest can be done with Airtable, but it's a department by department de uh, decision. So we have mission based cross functional department set up and they decide. But company-wide, that's the guiding rule. Um, talking about no-code, we use Make or Integromat company-wide. So if you start at, with Finn, you got a profile in Google Workspace to get your Gmail um, email, and then you auto-provision to Make, you auto-provision to, to Airtable. That's for us a company-wide tool. So everyone is familiar with Make. Yes, so at least they got an onboarding. So in the first week, you got an onboarding with some lovely videos made. By, uh, I think there's still a video made by me, but I'm not sure if they still use it <laughs> in the onboarding. I hope not because some outdated information in there. But you decide if you use that, right? I mean, I think um, I would love to see also customer care agents using no code to a certain degree, but I think the majority of um, 60 to 70% of our employees using um, make daily okay that's that's cool and do you have a rule of thumb um how to or when to automate work mm -hmm. so it's a it's one of our we call it engineering uh, core values you do it you do it you automate it so you you, you do it twice manually and then you ha uh, you should automate that but that's only engineering company-wide We use this also company wide, but that's more an engineering guiding rule. And, um, yeah. yeah, it's kind of, um, it, it's got, uh, we spread it uh, around the company. And so that's when everyone in the company is using that. So if you want, you can call that cozy. So we, I think we are cozy and that's why we, we love to automate by the, uh, and once you have this, uh, once you have this DNA established in your company, and we had the luxury to do this from Greenfield. 
it's easier to maintain. I can imagine, but um, the, the the migration project you you have right now sounds like a bit of work, right? Um, like I think it's 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 important to also moderate that because a lot of people are attracted to no code and low code. Um, is that like a like a state machine from no code to low code to hard code to pro code? Is that is that real? <laughs> and, and <laughs> I would love. To give you an, a, a simple answer, it's not. So, no code will stay with us all the time. And low code is something that we use for internal tooling. That's very clear to, to, to really also have these boundaries. Very, very clear. So, pro code, or let's say, put it on the proper web tier stack running on serverless, it's very essential to us for our core business. This is something I mentioned. Because we, we, we now, after three years of running a car subscription, we understand the complexity. And this was only feasible by using no code. So to really understand this massive beast, just to throw in, uh, to give you a number, 118, I think, partners. That's the number that we need to just to operate the car subscription business. That's not software as a services. Put another 100 on top of that. And like all this Zoom, Google Workspace and all this stuff. So just orchestrating all these partners is a beast. And now after three years, we, we are very confident. To, and I can tell you this, to orchestrate them, we know exactly what is to do. And that's why we bake that now into hard code. And this takes time. We do it step by step. We're starting with our most complex uh, domain. That's the operations department. We take the entity car. Then we take it, the entity subscriptions. We put them together, deliveries, in-fleeting, defleeting, fleet management, insurance, damages, appraisals. You know, I can talk now for decades about that. So, um, you just mentioned that you have over 100 partners and uh, OEMs amongst them. Um, how digital is that world, honestly? I mean, I can't. I can imagine. I, I mean, everyone <laughs> can imagine that, like a car manufacturer, most likely is not very digital. But then you think about Tesla, and you have an app, and you can do everything with your app, even repair your car through the app. And uh, is that I guess still uncommon, and I would assume that even Tesla most likely doesn't have an API. Is that is that true? And you're working with Tesla, I think. Yes, yes. So, um, so first of all, the uh, the question is absolutely great. So, <laughs> and, and now I need a political answer to that. And the political <laughs> answer to that is the following. So, I strongly believe from the bottom of my heart that the automotive industry is digital, and it. Uh, it in its core, no doubt about that. I mean, how can you build such a complex product in thousands and millions of them? You have to maintain this, let's say, complexity, beast and digitalization and automation is essential. Otherwise, um, but if we t uh, think about the interfaces to external partners, so for OEM, Tesla, BMW, Volkswagen, with all the new Uh, kids on the block, all the um, um, new OEMs from China. I think these interfaces, that's something new to them. And they, I think they have to get some traction there. And imagine in our, let's say, in this industry, we are, as for now, always the smaller partner. And we have to stay elastic. So we implement every API And if the API is just as simple as CSV or Excel, we integrate them. And guess what? We use no code for that. And then we can do it in minutes and stay elastic. But I'm very confident once we get the trust and we're building up the trust, we will get access to these proper APIs. Hey, in worst case, it's XML API and then I'm good. And then we go with the old school SOAP API, integrate that and, and all is good. I, I just imagine your your data center is most likely like everything is lambda functions, and then so you don't know about it. And then there's some hardware which is 
I think a few Raspberry Pis and a few fax machines, and the Raspberry Pis are connected to the fax machines, <laughs> then, <laughs> then fax it to the <laughs> manufacturers. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> I, I never saw uh, faxes so far, so I think we are good there. So uh, okay. no, no. So uh, email is a let's say well-known ape interface if you want to <laughs> <laughs> okay let's skip that um uh, i don't wanna 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 uh i don't know shout about the german car industry or anything or it's it's not only germany you just mentioned so everything's cool um so but let's let's go back to your setup so um you you, you have those or the the migration now from low code or from no code to to pro code is then essentially a postgres database with some lambda functions i guess for the apis mm -hmm. in a node then i guess mm -hmm. yeah so um excellent question so um serverless by nature if you want so so um actually the teams they have the flexibility to decide node.js or typescript um python or go um, I think, let's say, 85% is TypeScript. I would say another 14% is Python and 1% in Go. Uh, in Go. Um, I just heard about the, it was j actually just an API wrapper and written in Go. But let's see, this might change. That's a flexibility that the, the, the department can go for. Um, Postgres in the, uh, as, a, as a data storage. And, and, it's not really a migration project, but, and that's, I think, the, the very, very essential here. We provide the APIs, REST APIs, very often just a simple HTTP API with CRUD functionalities. We expose that, and then we, we call the make modules or make apps. You have an app in our no-code environment to um, access this data, and that's essential. So this data accessibil accessibility to no code is guaranteed with pro code or hard code. So everyone within Finn can t just like run, hey, please watch on this car. And if this car is produced, please notify me in this little scenario. And then they can, based on that, I don't know, take some actions, notify the customer with a short message. Hey, your car is in production. Isn't this nice? We expected the, the, the production um, to be finished in two weeks, and then we can build up some excitement, for instance. And this integration of hard code with no code, that's the beauty, and this is exactly what we do, what we do right now. Okay. Um, and the, the um, Lambda functions, is that... Like how professional do you maintain those? Is that are they tested? Is it test driven development? Um, do you use frameworks for it and so on? Or very classy, uh, classic setup. So no, uh, no surprises here. It's very classic software development. Really, really uh, classic. All the tests, um, end to end tests for our website. Um, for the money making process, we have integration tests, of course, or you can also go for some contract tests. Unit tests is something the teams decide if they, you know, if they have a code coverage of one hundred percent to guarantee that. Some others they would go for some integration tests. It's very, very classic, serverless. For deployment, we put everything on Lambda, very classic um, AWS setup. So I would say it's a very, very, very traditional WebT application just running on serverless. Yeah, just without Kubernetes. Without Kubernetes. Of course, we use Docker containers for the local environments. But yeah, so the beauty of serverless is you pay as you go, right? So you scale down, you scale up. Of course, it's, I wouldn't call it more cost efficient, but it's easier for us. Yeah, it's very very easy to calculate then who's producing which cost and uh, like which service is costing what and so on. So that that's the beauty of it, right? Um, Indeed, yes. And is like how many APIs does each team own? Um, could you elaborate on that? Is that do you have like multi API ownership? I guess or um, it depends. I would say. In most of the cases, a team is owning a single API. Mm. So um, as, on, uh, as of now, I think we have around 25, 30 APIs. Um, yeah, like 
Invoicing API, Payment API, Creditworthiness API, Lead API, Offer API, and things like that. Yeah, so, and and all these APIs, and I think that's um, the unique approach here again, is documented. So uh, we have uh, technical writers within every department, dedicated people, not engineers documenting the API because you know, <laughs> you know, engineers documenting API is always the question: um, how much time they have to put uh, this, this love into this documentation. That's why we we give them all the time by by just doing their job. And those technical writers are they also like engineers by heart or like where where do you get such people? Where, where do you get such people? That's like really a miracle. It's it's really not a miracle. It's fun because um, I mean, if you go to um, AWS, they have also lovely documented APIs, and someone is doing that. Yes. So this is what we did. I just just hired for our first API technical writer was someone from Yandex Cloud. <laughs> okay, so essentially, there's like really a profile technical writer for API documentations and you were just like hiring someone from Yandex. That, that's simple. But how big is that market? It's very niche. Yeah. <laughs> I have to admit it's very niche. So these are people with non-engineering background, but with a very high attention to detail. So we have also in our recruitment process, for instance, we use a tool called Brick. Uh, for um, to check on four different categories, and attention to detail is one of those. And then we know if people, uh, if this individual would be a great technical writer. So there, so I think we have now three full-time employees. No, two full-time employees and one intern. And they, are, in most cases, they have a background in something tech-related. Mm. So would they be able to also? I don't know, write an article about a certain technology and even include examples because they would be able to code like briefly? Um, it depends. I would say it, it really depends on the profile. So actually, fun story is they review all our technical um, articles that you see. Okay. So, and they are able to set up CI, CD pipeline for all the um, um, documentation. Um, so we use Redocly for that. Right, uh, we use uh, Open API, so they put this into the repository, then so the engineer uh, can take it from there. They do the let's say initial work, and then if uh, we an engineer would deprecate or add a parameter, they just go there and do this little adjustment by themselves. Okay, interesting. And then those APIs can be used in Make, uh, which was formerly called Integromat, or in Retool, which is also being used by engineering teams or also non-engineering people? That's a fun question because the best retools that I saw so far, they are built by non-engineers. They put a lot of love into like, you know, all these little Aussie effects in there. So um, currently I would say it's a 50-50 split. We have more than, I think, 300 users on our retool instance. Um, and the builders, this is how we call them. I would say it's around 60 to, to 70. And the, it's a 50-50 split. Engineers, not engineers. Very often business developers. And your APIs are simple REST APIs or GraphQL or? I think REST. I think we, as to my knowledge, we have no graph APIs so far. Maybe in our app, but I don't know. And... Um, when was this this moment when you realized, okay, it's getting too complex in like all the no code tools? Uh, we have to move to to like a professional strategy and go pro code and so on. Was there like a moment in time? Yes, <laughs> definitely yes. So um, it was one of this uh, magic Airtable moments. Um, so when we realized, okay. We are like exceeding every boundary that is there at the, in the Airtable. And then we, we kind of got forced to that. I had the last management call with the Airtable management to see if there is something that we can solve with, let, let's say, with money. The answer was not positive. And then, okay, let's do that. And then. Really? So, I mean, are they so unflexible um, in, in those companies? Like, 
can't imagine or hardly. There's like technical, it sounds as if it's technical boundaries really that can't be overcome or. I don't know. That was my assumption as well. Okay. But I don't, I, I really don't know. So that was blocking us. So that, that's a thin thing, by the way. We outgrow our partners very often. <laughs> like, it's not only Airtable, don't get me wrong. It's like delivery providers, car registration providers. We just outgrow them. They are not able to scale with us. And then we have to uh, find a better way, some a, a new partner or, um, yeah, leverage them even more. And that's, that's, that's nothing new, unique to us. Just to give you some context to that, we literally exchanged every partner in every single domain as of now. Registration provider, 24-7 provider, damage provider, we exchanged every single provider. Ima imagine doing that with hard code. Oof. Yeah, would be hard. <laughs> <laughs> And um, with tools like like Make, you can also cause a lot of damage to a business <laughs> 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 if you if you want or not. Like uh, accidentally, I don't know. Did ever someone accidentally order one hundred thousand cars or with a non-existing API? Not yet. Not yet. So, <laughs> well, okay. If it ends up in a spreadsheet and someone reviews it, then it wouldn't be bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I hope people are really, really um, using this tool, and they do. So, they produce also fabs, and that's good. We never played the bl uh, blame game, and but we had some really awkward and really fun moments as well, like self ddosing. I just remember um, a US colleague of us. He was checking some residual values for some cars for a deal before signing a contract with OEM. We, of course, check what, what, what will be the value of the car in a year. So we have more um, confidence on the value and can predict it better. So he took a spreadsheet and then just hammered the, number, uh, the, the data against an API. Yeah, he started that, went to sleep and then in the morning we woke up in Europe and like what the hell is going on the whole infrastructure was burning you know <laughs> <laughs> okay then we re realized okay that's that's the scenario just stopped it and all is good but hey we we had exactly the same experience in the past at least in my previous job on 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 the Kubernetes setup where all the pots were like starting and crashing every every Quite ten crazy, seconds yeah. And, yeah. and everything was burning and then you feel like you you enjoy this this flames and then you know you focus on the solution and classic troubleshooting and that's it. Okay, okay, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, like if you have that professional setup, then um, it most likely. Uh, won't cause too many fires. Uh. You have a very uh, traditional post-mortem on that. Yeah? Really, I think PagerDuty was the company that did some really nice articles on that. You have post-mortem on that. You realize what was like the uh, a certain, uh, assertions that you missed. You set up some processes on that and then all is good. And if it happens again, then your post-mortem wasn't good, right? So um, thanks a lot. If I want to get started or if you would now start from scratch um, and you could give like three tips for building a no code stack or let's rather say low code stack with pro code elements. So for CTOs that just just are, that are just getting started and want to want to follow like a similar strategy than, than you went through, um, what, which free advices would you give to people? Mm -hmm. To CTOs, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it's uh, it's very very essential that CTOs they should drive that because it's an organizational change that you have to drive. So essential, and you no code is something for your non engineering audience. You can enable this. That's called they, I think they call it citizen developers. You can really, really enable them, but by providing another tool. So imagine you give to an Excel guy another tool for automation, and they are smart and they are able to automate things like crazy. So you have to focus on that. It's something that you, as a CTO, you have to drive from an organizational point of view. Then you, um, that's number one, because because having like CRUD 
elements managed in your team uh, or scaffolds that where someone manually codes a front end for it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, I would avoid out. that. I would okay. avoid that just to increase efficiency of an engineer. I mean, yeah. or an engineering department. Yeah, of course, you can always hire a horde of, if, uh, of engineers, but hey, you need money for that, right? And you need to synchronize. And that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> It's more engineers job. is more fun, but also more problems right? because you're getting a bigger organization and then you have the traditional problems of a big organization. Very simple, okay. I would say. Yeah. So the second advice I would say is um, onboarding. Take the fear away. Onboarding, onboarding, onboarding. Hey, in worst case, you as a CTO, you put your face in front of a camera and record a one hour how to use this tool in worst case. This is what I did back in the days. It's very hands-on. And then you give examples and like real world examples, how to connect spreadsheets, how to connect to, to the CRM system, all the simple things, or in worst case, how to export a product feed. I mean, you should not use an engineer to export a product feed to Google Merchant Center or things like that. That's so crazy, right? Um, and number three, I think it should be enough onboarding. If you do that and you do it like for every onboarding, you're good. And we we have this onboarding once in a month. So don't forget, we have 20 plus new startups a month. We need a process for that. And are you using like also, is it tool driven in your company or like is, is there some onboarding project in Airtable that you just go through and uh, like move tasks from A to B or I don't know, Asana or something like that? It's, I think it's a, um, it's a demo on the Airtable. So you, you take Airtable, then spreadsheet and then make and then connect all the pieces. Yes, I think it, it's like that, but I'm not, conf uh, I'm not sure about how the onboarding is now. I think there's a mandatory video to watch. So there's a one hour meeting scheduled for you and then you're watching a video. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you get paid for it. All good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, okay. Um, and, and the third? I think I, I go for it uh, with, with this too. And then it's uh, j just do, uh, do this too and then you're good for now. And then you would uh, see new problems pop popping up. Like, um, how can you scale all, all these scenarios? You put some structure, naming conventions, but this is all known to us as engineers. We, we, we do that for how, how long? Like since 1980 already in a all somehow structured way and nothing is exploding right uh, until now, right? <laughs> so, um, Slowly coming to the end, is there like any crazy no-code tool you discovered in the last months that you would would like to get your hands dirty on, um, but you didn't for now because you want to focus on work and and simplicity? Sadly, no. But I I, I should take this time. You're right. So I, I have this one weird, really crazy idea in mind. Imagine, so I think we have now more than 2,000 scenarios. So 5 million operations a day. And I have this really weird idea in mind. What if I take an open AI and train that one on building scenarios? Will this open and I be able to out, automate automations? And then we get it. So this could be an interesting one, but it's more, you know, a weekend project, I would call it. And anything commercial you discovered that you would like to use? Any 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 crazy tool? Not yet. Ask me again in in two weeks. <laughs> okay, let's say three weeks. <laughs> okay. So, well, uh, no, sadly no. So I, I'm very happy with Make. We have a, a single tenant um, set up for us in Frankfurt, so we are isolated from all the other customers. So I'm I kind of happy with that. Okay, cool. Um, and then I still have a little surprise for you. So. Um, did you know that Airtable's history function has an Easter egg um, that can be activated through just clicking the button, the, the um, clock button 20 times? And I, I now do that. And um, through doing this, we have the chance to move back in time to the very early days of this Airtable base. And we now go to your 
your main base and to your old car table where everything started. Um, and we're moving back in time to the very early days of Finn, I think in 2019, um, when you were just sitting there like doing 10 interviews a day, uh, spending a lot of lots of time with with that Airtable base, um, discovering maybe the weaknesses of the system already. Um, and we observed yourself for, for a little while. Um, I, 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 you, you don't look that happy. You look a bit stressed, like more stressed than now. And you now have the chance to whisper something into young Andy's ears. What would it be? Oh, that's, that, that's a crazy... I love this question. Oh, I have a physical background, so I really love this question. I have to abuse the situation now, right? Can I go with <laughs> some investment tips? Like, oh, buy well, you, no? you, you, you could do You could do that, yeah. You could do that or... Um, you so just I have give two yourself... advices. Okay, number yes. one, investment to buy Bitcoin at three thousand, and then sell at sixty thousand. I think then I have a twenty x uplift. That's it's nice, <laughs> but um, yeah, just kidding. So um, to be honest, so I think I would do the following. I would only show to my former self um, what we have achieved so far with Finn, and. And all this additional, you know, plans and goals for the next years, like grow to 1 million car subscri subscriptions by 2030. And, and this should give just me all the trusting that it all comes together when you follow just some basic core beliefs that I have for myself. It's actually six of them. And that's it. And that's it. I think that's the trick. That's that's simple. I mean, well, injecting all that knowledge that you gained on the way <laughs> it isn't that simple, but it's a good idea. So um, thanks a lot for uh, the recording, Andreas. Um, and I hope to see you soon in person, maybe at the Oktoberfest or something. <laughs> I think I think it's a good really idea, yes. Really looking forward to that. And thanks a lot for, for um, all the all the hints and tips. And I, I think it's very valuable. Um, for like, especially for CDOs, I mean, not many um, are really comfortable with with this low code, no code setup, uh, and even Lambda maybe. Um, I, I, I observe, and um, a lot of people really want to have the control um, over every every button in the system, and I think that's a bit outdated. And um, I think that's really like a, a future proof strategy you're building there, and we're. We're following closely. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. And if you're in doubt, all the CTOs out there, just reach out to me. And because maybe I'm too crazy and then tell me that I'm too crazy. Maybe you are. <laughs> it, doesn't, okay. it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for the invitation, Toby. And um, for sure, you're we welcome. are going to see you uh, at the Oktoberfest, for sure. Thanks a lot, Andres. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the AlphaList podcast. If you like this episode, share it with friends. I'm sure they'll love it too. Make sure to subscribe so you can hear deep insights into technical leadership and technology trends as they become available. Also, please tell us if there is a topic you would like to hear more about or a technical leader whose brain you would like us to pick. AlphaList is all about helping CTOs getting access to the insights they need to make the best decisions for their company. Please send us suggestions to cto at alphalist.com. Send me a message on LinkedIn or Twitter. After all, the more knowledge we bring to CTOs, the more growth we see in tech. Or as we say on AlphaList, accumulated knowledge to accelerate growth. See you in the next episode.